All right. Hey, what's up, guys? Coach Mac, play fast football. All right. Doing uh, another live Saturday night. No football on this weekend. So figured uh be a good opportunity to get on here and, and talk a little bit about some stuff. Um, hope your weekend is off to a good start. Uh, depending on where you are and what the weather is, maybe you're snowed in or maybe you've got decent weather. We had decent weather today here in Florida. It was about 55, 56. Got a chance to go out and Work on my golf game a little bit, practice a little bit, play a couple holes. So that was nice because tomorrow is going to be nasty probably. But hope uh, hope your weekend is off to a good start. So what I wanted to do uh, today was talk a little bit about um, run fits uh, and, you know, kind of what I think about run fits, what I've been thinking about run fits the last couple of years, um, and then some interesting topics that have gone on you know, over the last couple of weeks, things that I've read, things that I've saw. So, um, you know, in the, in the title of the video, I put, you know, run fit static or dynamic and Chase, how you doing, bud? Um, and what I mean by that is, is when you try to be multiple on defense and you try to play different fronts and you try to play different coverages, what you have to understand is, um, Uh, the 49ers run schemes are outstanding. Um, don't know how much of that you could take into high school football. If you ever look at anything that the Niners do, um, a lot of their wide zone stuff, uh, they've got 15 or 16 different insertion points for the H back and how the center has to ID what linebacker he's working to. So, um, you know, big fan of what they do on offense, big fan of what they do in the run game, big fan of how they use multiple tight ends, H packs. Um, and, and some different things. Uh, Houston, what's up? H-Town. Um, but I don't know how much of that you could carry into high school, uh, to be honest with you. So um, when you think about being multiple on defense, you think about playing different fronts, different coverages, and you got to change things up, you got to confuse the offense. Well, one thing you have to understand is every time you change the front, every time you change the coverage, your run fits are going to become a little bit of an issue because they're going to be slightly different, right? So um, the more multiple you try to be, uh, the more you try to confuse the offense, the more you try to carry a comprehensive package of things on defense. What you have to understand is multiple fronts and multiple coverages are going to lead to the possibility of multiple run fits. Whereas if you are a little bit more um, static in your approach to some things, if you played a base front, like the tight front for argument's sake, all right, if you look at the tight front, what you're trying to do in the tight front is you're trying to eliminate one A gap with a nose, two B gaps with two four eyes, and you're trying to eliminate vertical entry. You're trying to deny that vertical entry, but you're also trying to eliminate where bubbles are, um, you know, trying to eliminate where the big bubble and the little bubble are. There's really no bubbles in the tight front or the bare front for that matter. But behind that, what, what you really get into is, whether you're playing it from a two linebacker box or maybe a one linebacker, three high safety box, what ends up happening is your linebackers have really simplistic, um, basic fits. Uh, they basically become A to C gap players. And then obviously you have to be able to handle the edge on each side. You have to be able to have force players depending on the coverage that you're playing. But the, you know, the inside backers can basically become A to C gap players. And based on your reads and your keys, um, you know, the only thing that'll take them out of that is maybe one puller, or multiple pullers where they have to, you know, maybe jump over, um, you know, maybe step, you know, instead of depending on how you fit it, when you're playing with a tight front, there's really no need to have a backer that steps up while one jumps over. You can almost essentially have both of them jump over because when you get gap schemes versus the tight front, a lot of times what you're going to get is, three down blocks, you're going to get a back block from the center. You're going to get a double on the nose, all right, or a base on the nose because they can't double because the center went back. The only way you'll get a double on the nose is if they leave the four eye for either a scoop hinge by the tackle in a power scheme. Um, if they run dart, they're going to have to block back on the four eye, usually with the guard. Um, you know, if they run dart, they can probably get a double on the nose now because they'll block back on the four eye if they're not reading them. And then they can double the nose to, to whoever they want. But then 
on the front side, they're still going to have the block down on the four unless they want to arc release and trap the four, the four eye, sorry. Um, so now you can, you can get it to where your backers can really play over the top of a lot of things. And then based on having the four eye front side, when they down block the four eye, there's really not going to be a lot of a gap entry because if the four eye is a decent player and he's being down blocked, he's going to occupy the B gap and then his helmet's going to be inside to where the a gap's going to look like it's, probably a little bit cloudy for a running back and there's nowhere to insert the ball. So your pull schemes are all going to have to go a little bit wider. So when you look at the tight front, you know, a couple significant things about it, you kind of know the schemes you're going to get. You kind of know where you want the ball to go and where you're trying to send the ball. And then you're making a very simplistic picture for your linebackers to fit. You know, when you, when you, get into shading the front and playing with a five and a shade and a four backside. Now you've got a big, a, you got a big B gap bubble, a small A gap bubble, depending on how they block it, you may get ISO schemes now. And now your linebacker has to step up and fit an open window and a B gap. If you're playing tight front stuff, you know, you're going to get very limited ISO potential. You know, you're going to get mostly down blocks or back blocks, or even if you get zone schemes, you kind of know where the ball is probably going to enter. If you play the defense correctly, you can get to a point where your defensive lineman can have very simplistic um, techniques and reads. So, you know, for us looking at playing the tight front, we're probably going to play the four eyes where they're going to read guards and not tackles. So our four eyes are probably going to read guards. And if the guard is at them, we're probably going to try and get vertical in the B gap. If the guard is down or away, then we're probably going to try and squeeze through the hip pocket into, you know, squeezing and, and making sure the, the, um, making sure that we are in the B gap and making sure we don't get scooped or cut off by the tackle. Um, more formations are only an issue if you can run multiple things from all those formations. Um, Cody, I think the biggest problem with offensive guys is they get multi-formational, but then they can only run certain plays from each formation. So as a defense, you can kind of then break it down and say, well, when they're in this personnel group or these formations, they can only run these two or three things. Um, the teams that have a way to be multi-formational shift trade motion and still carry um, their entire run game, or at least 90% or 80% of their run game, those are the teams that become a problem because now you got to deal with formations and you got to deal with schemes. A lot of times, though, when teams change formations, they become so multi-formational that they get into certain sets and all they can run are certain schemes. So you're able to, from a game plan perspective or – from a breakdown perspective, you're able to break it down and say, all right, well, when they get into this personnel group with these formations, you know, we have to be able to line up to these formations and we have to make sure we're sound in our alignment, but they can only run these one or two, um, you know, offensive run schemes. So I think, um, I think to me, the teams that are most dangerous are the teams that are able to do everything that they want from a set of formations where it doesn't change. Um, and, understand that they are formationing you to cause some issues, but they still can get to their entire package from those formations. Uh, the teams that get crazy with formations, but then can only do certain things. I think they kind of back themselves into a corner formationally to where they're multiple, they're dynamic with their formations, but then they can only do so many things. So um, I would say a team that has a couple formations that give you some issues, um, they can do it from similar personnel without changing, and then they can carry their whole package from those formations would be the most troublesome to me. Um, yeah, I, I think, Michael, to be honest with you, I think it depends on the four eye. Um, I think what you're starting to get now is a lot of arc schemes, and they're starting to find out that they're getting arced by the tackle and they're widening to get hands on a tackle, but then they're either getting trapped or they're getting kicked or they're getting red on the arc. So, um I think a lot of guys are now starting to find out that you can play a, a loose three or a four eye and read the guard and make it kind of simple. I, it, the thing I like about it is you can then, if you did shade the front and you played a five, you could probably tell the kid it's the same thing. If the tackle is down, we're going to squeeze hard as heck. If the tackle is at us, then we're going to try and get vertical in the C gap. Um, obviously if you're not trying to play any, you know, two gap stuff or, 
anything where you let the five technique go under base blocks or reach blocks. Um, if, if you if you keep it the same for the four eye when he goes to a five technique, now I think you can get multiple reps and multiple, um, you know, you can get a lot of work and be multiple in your drill work because a kid that's a four eye is going to play a five technique the same way. Um, he's just going to read the tackle instead of reading the guard. But if the tackle's down, we're going to be down and we're going to squeeze. If the tackle is out, we're going to try and get vertical in that C gap. Um, you know, now a lot of times when you have a big B gap bubble, a lot of teams will like to play a thicker five technique. And if he gets any base or out blocks, they let him go underneath and they take the B gap away by letting him two gap. Uh, and then they can do some things with the overhang and let him play where they want to let him play. But, you know, to me, it is – especially over the last couple of years as, and again, I say this every week as I get older, what I start to figure out is we'd probably be better being more simplistic, playing faster, having similar fits um, and trying to keep the fits as conducive as we can and trying to keep the reads and the keys as conducive as we can. So that when we do try to change fronts or coverages, our kids can play relatively simply and relatively fast. Um, you know, the, the, the converse way of looking at is you might, you know, you might be able to play multiple fronts and you just teach your linebackers who to read and what to key. And then you basically teach them that they're going to fit, you know, open windows and they're going to scrape closed doors. And it doesn't really matter what gap is open in front of them. You don't have to teach them what gaps are open. If you teach, if you just teach them reads and keys, and you teach them how to fit based off the picture they see in front of them, you know, now you might be able to get to where you can go from a tight front to a shaded front. And now a kid can have an open B gap in front of them. But the thing to me that always makes it a little bit problematic is when you have open gaps, now there's isolation theories and now a kid might have to plug when you close gaps up on somebody and you take B gaps away from linebackers by playing a tight front or even bare front stuff you kind of get it to where they know that isolation theories are probably out the window. And now they know they're going to see a lot of zone gap theories and you can make their fits relatively simple. Um, I think you can play the nose a lot more aggressive. Um, if that's the theory and that's the case, I think you can play the nose a lot more aggressive because he can be as physical as you want on the center. And if he falls in the backside a gap then that's where you want him anyways, you don't have to worry about him playing breach blocks. You don't have to worry about him. You know, obviously he's going to get doubled and you got to be able to hold the point. But most of the time when he gets doubled, he's probably going to get knocked into a backside A gap anyway. So it's going to keep things rather consistent um, for your linebackers. You know, I was reading something on Twitter yesterday where a guy was at a clinic and he said, you know, it's amazing when you go to talk run fits at a clinic and you might listen to 10 different guys and they give you 10 different versions of how they fit runs. And, when you think about that as a defensive coach, when we start getting into that um, rabbit hole and we start figuring out that when we play different structures, different fronts or coverages that our fits change a little bit, you know, well, now how are our kids going to play in a consistent manner? How are we going to coach it in a consistent manner when we've got to tell them, well, you know, you got to do this when we're in this front or when we're playing this coverage. But if you are in this front, then we're going to do it a little bit differently. So, you know, I always go back to, um, I always go back to thinking about if, if, if your linebackers could play reads and, and keys and just fit things based on open windows, closed doors, um, you know, maybe that's the best way to go. Uh, tight end surface stuff is always going to be the first question, Michael, everybody asks you about um, playing tight front. My question to you would be A, how many tight end surfaces do you see? Because I don't see a, a bunch. B, how many tight end wing surfaces do you see? Because I don't see a bunch. Um, C, can you stay in a tight front without – if they can get you to shift the front and shade the front because they play a tight end surface, well, then they're kind of dictating to you what you need to do based on the surface that they present. So my first answer would always be, can we boss or bow the backers – can we move the backers to where they need to be to take away the leverage of the three-man surface? Um, God bless you if, you if that's what you see, because we don't see it. We hardly ever see it. So um, 
we deal with more 10, 11, 20, uh, not a lot of 21 personnel teams, not a ton of 12 personnel teams. So, um, you know, if that was the case, then I may think about not being a tight front team. If the two best teams in my league that I have to beat every year are 12 personnel and I don't like 12 personnel versus tight front, then I would probably change my philosophy because no matter where you coach or what you do, the bottom line is you got to beat the people on your schedule and you got to beat the best teams in your league. So you should probably work your defense to fit the best teams in your league. So I'm not quite sure if we had two teams in our league that were 12 personnel. I, I don't know if we'd be tight front. Um, I don't know if we would look at tight front stuff and, and the adjustment to it to 12 personnel. Um, you know, I don't know if we would, how much our philosophy would change. Because really, in essence, you know, defense becomes playing what you need to stop. Um, and I always look at it as we have to defend certain structures. And if we can defend those structures, then we're going to be okay. We, Like I said, we see where I am, we see mostly 10, 11, 20. Um, so if we can play those structures, if we can defend power counter, um, we've got a pretty good chance uh, year in and year out. If uh, there's not a ton of great zone teams that we see, um, there's not a ton of great wide zone teams that we see. So a lot of in the offseason, a lot of the discussions you have really become moot points because when the application, you know, the theory of it is great and the discussions are great in the offseason. But when it comes to the application, if you don't see a lot of those things, then they're really just discussions that you're having just to have discussions. Um, but if I were in your shoes and we were seeing 12 personnel teams with attached tight ends, three man surfaces, and those are the teams that we had to beat, well, then I may change my tune a little bit. We may play more shade five technique fronts with a four eye on the backside. You know, if it's double tight ends, we may load the box a little bit more and play more static three, three stack looks or static three, four looks where we're playing with more head up or five techniques uh, and a head up nose and two backers in the box all the time. Um, I'm not sure how much three high safety I would play if I was facing uh, a lot of 12 personnel teams. We might not want to be a, a, a three high structure. So, I think defensively, it always needs to be based on who you have to defend, what you have to stop, and then everything else becomes theory, clinic talk, Zoom talk, off-season talk. You know, but at the end of the day, you've got to carry things that are going to win games um, versus the people that you have to that, ver the people that you have to beat. So, um, my question to you would be: What do you play on defense, and how do you try and defend twelve personnel? Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's 12 personnel that has an H-back or, you know, it becomes more pro-orientated, twins-orientated stuff, then I think reduction is a great way to go. If it becomes double tight, then reduction is going to have its issues. You know, the to the reduction side, are you going to play a three and a seven? Uh, what are you playing behind it in the secondary? Where are you going to set the nickel or the, you know, the extra outside linebacker DB, however you want to look at it? Um, that's why for me uh, – Generic three, four stuff was always so good, um, especially from a quarter structure, if you can handle the box, because now if a team comes out and double tight 12 personnel, you just play quarters to both sides. You got two overhangs. You can make them nine techniques if you want to. You've got two backers in the box. You've got two safeties that are going to make it a nine man box real quick. Um, you know, in my opinion, most of the 12 personnel teams in high school really can't throw the ball um, all that well. The matchups on the outside usually don't become that much of an issue. The 12 personnel teams that get into 12 personnel are usually doing it to run the ball, create extra gaps, do things, get extra hats in the box. Um, if you face a 12 personnel team that is multiple, that can throw the ball, they've got dudes outside, um, you know, then that becomes a tough game plan. That becomes a tough ask, and you got to figure out exactly what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, So if you play three, seven to the weak side, you're going to play quarters with the boundary safety. Who's the flat player? Or are you just going to lock the weak side? And basically if the tight end puts his hands on the seven technique, then the boundary safety is going to be a force player and get involved in the run game. If the tight end arc releases or the tight end releases to the flat, you're going to lock it with the safety. I could see quarters to the nickel side. Cause you got him sitting out there to play, you know, 
swing deep at two. He, he can play the wheel at two to the three seven side. If the wheels in the box as an a gap defender, now you've only got a safety and a corner out there. So it's tough to play quarters to the boundary side, or at least true quarters. You're going to end up playing some type of locked man scheme or some type of um, bastardized quarters. Look, it's not going to be true quarters because you won't have a flat player, but, um, and I, I, I've seen people do that. It works. Um, it works really well to where, to the three seven side, you play a safety that's locked on a tight end, and the seven technique makes it a real easy read because if they're going to block the seven, the tight end's usually going to put hands on them. Arc release schemes make it tough, but usually, you know, you can the arc release block from the arc release vertical or or passing route is usually something that's a little bit easier to see uh, if you rep it enough and you study enough film, but. You know, 12 personnel double tight is always going to be a good package. Um, I think it's tough to find those bodies in high school. It's tough to get good at. But when when teams can get good at it in high school, that that's that's a tough personnel grouping to handle, you know, to handle. And if I could handle the box, I would probably try and play three, four stuff with two overhangs or two nine techniques. And I would probably play quarters to both sides because I have curl flat players to both sides. Again, I'd probably only be rushing three, maybe adding a fourth from one of the inside backers. Um depending on the coverage structure. But, um, you know, again, it, it, that's what makes the game so fun. It, that's what makes coaching so unique is everybody's different. Everybody has to face different things, um, depending on what conference you're in. Obviously, when you, you know, you look at college football and you look at the Big 12 and everybody tried to find out, you know, defenses that could stop spread air raid stuff. And, you know, the Big 10 was hanging on a, a more run orientated style for a while. So that, you know, the defensive structures might've been a little bit different. The SEC in the old days was always, you know, run first. So it was heavy eight man boxes and, 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 you know, defensive structures were based on that. But now that you're seeing more spread air raid quarterback run, um, you know, I think you're the, the, the tight front light box theory is becoming, um, you know, predominant in, in a lot of parts of the country because people are starting to find out that they can eliminate inside gaps Um and they can force the ball to go where they want it to go. Now you have to tackle in space. You have to eliminate C gaps, which is always going to be a little bit of an issue. But um, to me, if you can deny vertical entry in a high school run game and you can make the ball go C gap or wider, um, I think you have a chance. Uh, that's why even your even front teams or teams playing with five techniques were always trying to spill uh, down blocks as hard as they could and get, you know, spill the first block and get it to, get the power of the counter to bounce and, and go to the edge and then having support players and guys ready to run to the edge. Um, but again, I think it all comes down to run fits. I think it all comes down to how simplistic you can make those run fits, whether it's 12 personnel, 10 personnel, 11, 20, it doesn't really matter what it is. You have to be able to fit runs and you've got to be able to fit runs in a consistent manner. So for me, it's always trying to find a way, you know, now, Offensive guys will look and go, well, if I know the front, I can game plan and, and I know the schemes that I'm going to carry to beat that front. Well, defensively, if we know in that front how we're going to react to certain schemes and how we're going to fit them, I would much rather take my chances of my kids fitting things right. And then we have to come up with answers to get an extra body here or there, or maybe we have to move and stun a little bit into some things. Um, that to me is always um, a better scenario then kids that don't know how to fit runs, kids that don't understand gap responsibilities, maybe kids that don't understand how to spill, kids that don't understand the difference between, um, you know, kids that don't understand the difference between how you're going to exchange gaps if you're spilling. So if you're an inside linebacker and you get a gap scheme and, you know, the gap in front of you is taken away by the defensive end that spills, now we've got to jump over. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, I think anytime you can get to a situation, doesn't matter whether it's even or odd, if you can get to a situation where your run fits stay rather consistent with your D linemen and your backers and your force and support players and your, your keys and your reads and your fundamentals stay rather consistent. I think you're always going to have a better chance to play, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room on defense all the time is you want to carry so many different things. And the more things you carry, the better chance you have to bust your run fits, your coverages, um, you know, gap assignments, things like that, because you're trying to carry so much in your plan. So I think sometimes as defensive coaches, we get kind of carried away and we put too much on our kids plate and on paper, we love it in a game plan. We love it on the weekend, Sunday coming out of meetings, we feel really great about it. And then on Friday night, we find out that there's just too much going on and we can't fit it consistently. So, um, 
you know, the idea behind a tight front is trying to find a consistent manner in which to fit things and a consistent manner in which you know where the ball is going to go. Now, yes, you're going to give up. You know, if you say, how do you defend tight end services? Okay, well, if we've got a four eye and a tackle has leverage on a four eye and we leave our backers inside the tackle box or inside the tackles and the tight end has leverage on backers. Now, when we get gap schemes, we're going to have all walls. They're going to have leverage. They're going to get the ball to the perimeter. So, you know, my answer would be, all right, well, what if we boss or bow or push or pull or, you know, use our backers to where we set them a little bit more in the gaps that they're probably going to have to defend. So if we, you know, if we bossed our backers to a tight end set and we put the mic over near the C gap and we bump the wheel almost stacked on the center. Well, now if you get gap runs coming at you, the mic's a C gap player anyways, the wheel's an A gap player on the backside. If runs go away, now you need a wheel that can get to the C gap from there and a mic that can get to an A gap off of what the nose does. If you're a three high team, then you're going to need a middle safety that can fit, you know, based on, what you're playing and how you're playing it, you're going to need a middle safety that can fit almost like an inside linebacker. So to me, when I look at it with the tight front stuff, I feel like I can dictate where the ball is going to be a little bit more. And I feel like I can dictate where my backers are going to have to go uh, based on certain schemes. And then we can figure out whether we want to, you know, if teams are Y off 20 personnel and the sniffer takes you to the ball 90% of the times, and we want to fit off of the sniffer front side, backside, then, you know, we can do that with the inside backers because they know they're going to be a gap to C gap players, you know, pretty much as long as everybody else does their job. And then we just have to work on our support structure from the outside. So if we're quarters and we have a force player, well, then, you know, we're going to fit the C gap tight. We're going to send it to the force player and then we're going to have somebody run in the alley in between the inside backer and the force player. And he's going to fix everything off of that. Um, you know, so. The, the, the more I look at it, the more I talk to people, the more I see people posting things on clinics about run fits and how, you know, intricate it gets and how complicated it can get, depending on who you're listening to. Um, you know, the, the more I start to think that we need to be a little bit more static in nature and then we need to have answers off of our static. You know, if we're going to be tight front and we're going to present a very similar front, and a very similar box most of the time, um, then we need to have our movements ready to go and we need to have our you know, our, our, where we're going to bring a fourth from, are we going to move the line at all? Um, and then how are we going to send five? How are we going to send six? What are we going to do after our base structure? Because obviously if you're more static in nature, then the other team's going to have a way to come up with game plans and things to attack the tight front. So the thing that I like about playing tight front stuff is we're now starting to see week in and week out, year in and year out, we're starting to see the schemes that, attack the tight front. So we're starting to get more tackle pulls. Well, if we're starting to get more tackle pull schemes, then we can maybe change how we read some things with our backers. You know, we're starting to get, um, you know, pin and pull stuff, the ball trying to go to the perimeter with leverage. But, you know, the one thing that stays consistent when you're playing tight front stuff is when teams want to be gaps, if you've got good four eyes that can't get cut off by tackles, you're constantly forcing the center to go back on the four eye. You're constantly going asking a guard to block down on a nose and a tackle to block down on a, excuse me, a front side four eye. So to me, in the high school world, we're now forcing three one-on-one blocks. If we have any decent D lineman at all, we're going to win every, you know, a few of those one-on-one blocks. We're going to win and make some plays with our D lineman. And if we don't win and we hold the point, now we're keeping people off of our second level players. Um, you know, so if you look at it from a three, two box, they can only get pullers up to your two linebackers. Your two linebackers should be able to run wherever they want to run because if they're a gap scheme team and they can't hinge the four eye, then they're going to have to put the center back, guard down, tackle down, and now you got three one-on-one blocks with backers that are able to run. So, um, you know, I go back and forth on it all the time. I go back and forth between, you know, playing shaded fronts. If we get tight end surfaces, playing a five technique and a shade and going back to old reduction theories, But as soon as I do that, then I start thinking to myself, well, we're right back in a world with a big B gap, small A gap, two bubbles. How are we going to defend bubbles? How are we going to fit bubbles? Um, You know, so every time I go back and look at it that way, I go right back to thinking about just playing tight as a base theory and then building things off of the tight front to protect it because I think we can be more consistent. I think we can be sound. I think we can, I think I can take some things off of my D line and my linebacker coach's plate by allowing them to, to, concentrate more on techniques and, and, and drills and not have to worry about how different we're fitting 
each deal. Now, again, if we were to shade the front, what I would do is I would try and play my five techniques the same way I play my four, my four eye techniques. So the four eye reads the guard and we're going to play the five technique the same way off the tackle. So now the D line coach can get quality reps in his individual and he can work on similar things over and over again, because whether we play a four eye or a five, we're going to treat all those blocks the same. Um, again, as long as we're not two gap and as long as we're not allowing the five technique, I go back and forth all the time to say, all right, well, if I'm going to play with a big gap bubble, then I'm going to let the five technique play thicker and be a two gap player. And now again, I'm going to have to teach my linebacker how to fit windows, scrape doors, because now we've got a chance for a five technique to go under a block late. If he gets a base block or a reach block, we're going to allow him to cross face. So now when he crosses face, that initial B gap window that might be open, we don't need to plug it anymore. We need to jump over it because the five technique is taking it away. So, you know, when you, when you think about all those theories and you think about all those deals, they're all great on paper. They're all great discussion points. Um, you know, the more comprehensive we can be on defense with our fronts and our coverages, obviously the tougher we make it for the offense. But at the end of the day, I think you have to sit back and say, okay, do we want to be beat by an offense that we make beat us? Or do we want to get beat because we have a scheme that we feel on paper is very good, but our kids can't play it. Now that all comes down to coaching. I get it. It comes down to your staff. Um, high school coaching staffs are tough to build or tough to find or tough to keep. So getting consistency with a D line coach and a linebacker coach and a secondary coach so that you can understand how you're fitting things and, and how you're practicing and what your reads and your keys are. And if there are any subtle changes and fits, how those are going to change, you know, it's, it's tough to do in high school because staffs are in a constant state of flux. They're always moving. It's hard to find good guys. When you find good guys, it's hard to keep them in the teaching positions that they have. There's not a lot of guys that want to teach a full course load and go out and coach anymore. A lot of guys want to be phys ed or they want to be computer classes or, or grade recovery classes because they want to be able to do their football work as well as their day job. So, um, you know, that's another thing that I look at sometimes when we're choosing our scheme, not only is it the personnel that we have, not only is it the teams that we have to defend, but it probably also needs to be based on what our coaches can coach and what we can teach our coaches to coach. Because as a coordinator, you're not going to be there for Indy all the time. You're not going to be at every drill. You're not going to be able to see what the D linemen are doing all the time and the linebackers or the safeties are doing. you got to trust that your coaches can get the job done. You may be able to give them the drills you want to do you may be able to talk to them about what you really need to get done this week versus a certain team. And these are the things I'd really like you to focus on during your Indy um, or, you know, when we get into small groups or inside run, these are the things that we really got to look at. We got to analyze them on film when we film practice. Um, but to me, if I could make it simpler for my coaches and say, Hey, look, we're going to major on this front. So you're going to major on these techniques and your linebacker coach is going to major on these keys and these fits. And then we build some answers off of that. So if we're broken stack playing a tight front with three, three, five personnel and we're broken stack, can we then go back and be a true three, three stack team so that if we face tight end sets, we can get back to a, to a six man box, a full three, three stack. We can go to playing two, five techniques with, you know, stack backers behind them. Um, you know, whatever your situation may be, whatever you're doing on defense, as long as you have an answer for when teams go um, tight end, three, three man surface. Sorry, cat needed to get out. Um, as long as you have an answer for that stuff. And again, anytime you play tight front, you better be ready for people to ask you, how do you handle tight end surfaces? How do you handle you know, certain schemes, because that's always going to be the first thing they ask you. And as a defensive coach, one of the things I would say all the time is, well, if you're asking me that because that's how you would attack it, well, then if we know how everybody's going to attack our tight front stuff, then we should be able to put together some type of comprehensive game plan to protect the tight front if we know all the schemes we're going to get. So I feel better knowing that teams are going to attack it a certain way. Um, and, you know, knowing that we can practice a little bit more efficiently because we know the schemes we're going to see. Uh, you know, I feel better about that than I do. Yes. It's a negative at, at times you can look at it and say, okay, well you better be able to handle 
three-man surfaces or tight end wing sets or 12 personnel because as soon as you're tight front, they're going to add tight ends. Well, a lot of schools aren't good enough to add tight ends. A lot of schools aren't good enough to play with three-man surfaces. A lot of guys don't like doing it. They don't have enough in their package when they carry it. They do it because they know it's an answer versus tight front or, you know, they know it's an answer versus certain deals. Um, if you're a three high safety team, they're going to try and play 21 personnel because they think that's an answer to three high safety. But um, when when you really think about it, if you can make an offense do things that are outside their comfort zone just because of how you play defense, well, then you've already accomplished half your goal. If you present a picture to offensive coordinators that makes them do certain things, maybe they're good at them. And if they're good at them, then, you know, you're going to have tr- you're going to have trouble that week. But a lot of times guys are only. Within their offensive structure, guys are, you know, 100%, Michael, you you will coach your coaches 100% more than you will coach your players. A lot of times in high school, guys aren't good enough and, and the personnel's not good enough to just randomly roll a tight end in or to randomly go double tight to create more gaps. It's a good theory on paper. It's a good clinic season talk. But if you're not good enough to do it with your offense, then it doesn't really matter. You can present that problem. But it doesn't become a problem if you can't be good at what you're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's tough to find committed coaches. It's tough to find guys that want to do all the things that you want to do. If you're, you know, um, a big time ball guy and you want to do football all the time and you have guys that are kind of just there because they like it, but it's not really a lifestyle for them. It's going to be tough. I mean, high school's a state, a constant state of flux with coaching staffs, even colleges nowadays and, Hell, the NFL is even a constant state of flux. So, you know, it, to me, it's you got to have a system that travels and you got to have something that you can teach so that when coaches roll in and roll out and, you know, there's going to be times where you have coaches that can't make practices because they have another job. You're going to have times where coaches have to be other places or have to leave early because they have responsibility with their kids. You know, this is not a world where guys are making three hundred thousand dollars to coach. So they can't leave to do other responsibilities. They can't leave practices early. You know, this isn't college. This isn't the NFL. It's high school football. And as a high school football coach, you have to understand all the dilemmas that come with it. And some staffs have the luxury of having 15, 18 guys and more than one guy at a position. So if one guy has to leave early or one guy can't make it, they have another guy there that's just as good as he is. Some staffs coach with six or seven guys, you know, so it's, it's the nature of the beast. It's, it's improvise and adjust. It's adapt and overcome. It's, you know, survival of the fittest. So I think when choosing your schemes, that's something that you got to look at. So, you know, I'm always looking at a way to simplify run fits. I'm always looking at a way to make things a little bit simpler for the players, simpler for the coaches. And at the end of the day, if it's sound and we can do it correctly, um, you know, then, then that's really what we're trying to get to. Uh, I mean, triple option is assignment football and every defense that you play, you should probably make sure you always have, you know, somebody on the dive, somebody on the quarterback, somebody on the pitch. Um, you know, the biggest principle I can give you about triple option teams is figure out who the dude is and take the ball out of his hands. So um, when you're playing an option school, always remember as a defense, you choose who gets the ball. Um, I know the quarterback is reading people. And he's going to make the decision of where the ball goes. But if you really back it up and think about it in its truest form, the defense decides where the ball is going to go. So if they if they're a team and the fullback is a dude, then play things to take the fullback away, make the quarterback beat you, make him pitch it. If the quarterback is the guy, then maybe you want to force feed it to the fullback and make sure the quarterback can't keep it and make sure that they can beat you a different way. If, you know, if the wing or the A back or the B back are the guys and you know, they're going to arc and, and become, you know, or orbit and become pitch players or whatever. Well, then you better make sure that you can take the pitch away and, and figure out how to handle the dive in the quarterback and make sure that the ball doesn't get to the perimeter. Um, so, you know, with triple option football, RPO football, you you got to remember that you dictate as a defense where the ball goes. So, um, you know, always game plan to where their best player is, do things that take away their best player. But I think any sound defense, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, nowadays you are you have to defend option almost all the time. So if a team is in a shotgun and the quarterback uses read games, then it's either double or triple option principles every single play. So um, it may not be Army, Navy, Air Force, you know, or it may not be true wishbone. It may not be true 
double wing flex bone. It may not be true triple option that we grew up with, but nowadays as a defensive coach, you face option football almost every week. Anytime somebody's in a shotgun, you can be pretty sure that you have to be sound with how you're going to handle, you know, the die, you know, the inside component or the vertical component and the horizontal component, you know? So if it's, if it's zone read, then the zone is the vertical component and the quarterback's the horizontal component. If it's, if it's power read, then, you know, the tailback or the jet player is the horizontal component and the quarterback's the vertical component. So, However you look at that, you've got to be able to handle the vertical component, the, the horizontal component, and 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 figure it out from there. But the way I always approach it is if the quarterback's a dude, then we're going to make sure we play him and he's got to give the ball. If the tailback's a dude, we're going to chase that and take it away as much as we can, and we're going to make the quarterback you know, kind of keep it and beat us. If the quarterback is an RPO guy that throws the heck out of it and they've got dudes on the outside, then – we're going to do some things up front that take interior gaps away so that our overhangs can hang a little bit longer and take RPOs away and make them beat us with the run game. So, you know, at the end of the day on defense, you dictate where the ball goes. You dictate what the offense does in, in nature. Now, I know a lot of people look at that and go, well, the offense calls the plays and the quarterback is the person who gives the ball or throws the ball. Yeah, I get all that. But when you play a good offense, they're going to do the things that the defense gives them. So a quarterback's going to throw routes that the defense gives him. He's not going to throw it into coverage. He's going to throw it based on what you take away. If they have coverage beaters, then he's going to throw it to, you know, the route that beats the coverage, depending on on how your defense players react. If they're a zone read team, then he's going to do, you know, if you're going to sit and make him give, then he's going to give. If you're going to squeeze, then he's going to pull. So you're going to dictate who has the football. So, I mean – I think in every defense, you probably got to figure out who the dive player is or the vertical component is, who the horizontal quarterback player is, and how you're going to hand pitch. That's just – nowadays, it used to be, you know – and when you think about like when Paul Johnson went to Georgia Tech and he had – a majority of his success was either the first time he played a team or when he played teams during the season that didn't have a lot of time to prepare. A lot of the bowl games that he played in, he would go to the bowl game and their offense would get absolutely smoked because the team would have – a month to prepare for triple option football. So, um, you know, nowadays I think we get more preparation for triple option football because of zone read, shotgun, power read, you know, bash theories and all those things that, you know, we're facing it more and more. It used to be you, you only saw option when you saw a flex bone team and then your defense wasn't used to playing flex bone teams. You weren't used to playing option. So that week it was, you know, um, complete chaos and, and, scrambling to try and play option football because you don't see it. Well, now with the shotgun stuff, you see it all the time. I think more defenses are ready to handle option football. You know, and again, that's just my opinion. Um, with everything else I talk about, it's strictly my opinion. Playing tight front or bare front, having simplistic fits for your inside linebackers is strictly my opinion. You know, there's guys that are going to play multiple fronts, multiple coverages, have multiple fits, and they're going to win a ton of games. You know, there's guys that are going to play – bare front, send five every down and, and win a ton of games. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, a million ways to skin a cat, different ways to skin a cat. But if you realistically think about it and, and you read some of the stuff on Twitter and you talk to different people during clinic season, you'll find out that run fits become this really gray, um, you know, almost hidden agenda. You know, almost I can guarantee you almost any time you pull something up on YouTube or on any clinic, if you pull up any clinic of a of a de of a defense coordinator or a DB coach talking coverage, they 100% of the time talk coverage responsibilities. They almost never talk to you about how they fit runs from those coverages. You have to literally find a run fit session or a run fit deal where they almost never talk about the coverage component because for some reason, every time people talk coverage, all they ever talk about is the coverage part. And to me, it's kind of, you know, it's um, counterintuitive or nonproductive in high school because half the coverages we're playing in high school, you better figure out how you fit the runs in those coverage. Because to me, I still think 75 to 80 percent of the game we see in high school is run. Um, and I think if you broke down your opponents over a 10 week period, over a full season and you broke down all the snaps and you you maybe throughout some of the, um, you know, outliers of you were up by 21 points or, you know, whatever the case may be, if you just look at base scenarios 
how teams play and what they do, I would guarantee you if you did the analytics on that, your your league, your conference where you are is probably 80% run, 75% run, 70% run at the worst. Yes, there are some teams that are still run and shoot, air raid, four wide, chunk it all over the place. But to me, they become few and far between. Um, you know, it's that's the million dollar question, Steve. You can ask it every single day with every video you look at. I've never, I've almost never come across a Rip Liz video in my career where they talk about the run fits. Every Rip Liz video I come across is always about the pattern match, how they play the pattern match, the rope, the two guys inside, and how they play the robot technique, how they play the overhangs you know, outside and low and how they play four verticals. You almost never get a true down to earth, full on run fit session from that, from those, you know, certain structures. Even when you, even when you listen to split field dudes, every time they talk split field, they talk coverage. And I don't understand why other than I know explosives will get you hurt real quick, but I don't understand why coverage is such a big component when your audience is high school coaches, you probably should talk more run fits and more techniques to stop runs than you should, um, you know, talk about coverages. Last week, when I, when I, when we did YouTube live last week, we were talking about pressure packages. And, you know, if you look at the guys in college, they're always looking at protection. They're always looking at where the center turns. They're always looking at how they can get a matchup on a running back. All their simulated pressures and creepers are based off of, drawing the center one way so that they can get a matchup on the other side. Well, those things are great when you know that the analytics tell you that you have to get off the field on third down and it's a passing scenario. If it's third and five in high school, you better defend trap. You better defend ISO because you're still going to get run theory. So, you know, the greatest Sims and creepers in the world with guys dropping out and you're showing six man pressure and you're dropping out and only sending four and you're still getting a quarterback to get rid of the ball and he's throwing it into coverage because, you know, you simulated the pressure to where he thought he was getting two off the edge from the front side and those two guys bailed and somebody came weak from the fourth side and you got a matchup on the back. You forced the center to turn to the field and you brought a guy from the boundary. You know, those things are all beautiful in the offseason. They're lovely in February. They're awesome in clinic rooms or at the bar after a clinic sit down and play high school football. And all of a sudden you start figuring out that third and five is a rundown. I don't know, you know, I don't know how great those things are anymore. I mean, I know they're still good, um, but I would like to hear somebody talk to me, you know, and tell me how they run Sims and creepers to stop runs. I would like to see somebody talk to me about, you know, simulated pressure geared to get tackles for losses, you know, rather than telling me about the simulated pressure to heat up a quarterback or to still be able to drop seven, send four and get pressure on the quarterback, you know, I would like somebody to tell me, okay, well, in my world, third and five is a rundown. So tell me, you know, what Sims or what creepers or what do I need to be doing to affect the power scheme or a trap scheme or an ISO scheme, because that's what I'm going to see, you know? So I think sometimes the problem, um, you know, with, with social media, uh, even YouTube at times and, and clinics, the guys that are talking to us are not playing the same game that we are. Um, Rock, my man, how's Michigan? Um, Chase, what's up, buddy? How you doing? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just one of those deals where the guys that are talking and doing the speaking – are playing a different game than we are They're coaching a different game than we are. Um, and when, when, you know, obviously they're very good at what they do. Obviously we need to go to them because they're probably more knowledgeable than we are a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times those guys, you know, they're making big time money. They're coaching football full time. They're being paid to stop, uh, you know, all these new offenses out there. So obviously we want to go to them with our information, but, as a high school guy, the worst clinics I've ever gone to have been listening to NFL speakers. And it's not because they're bad coaches. It's just because the things they're talking about just really don't translate to what we need to do and what we need to coach. So, you know, I've always taken great notes. I've always gotten some 
little tidbits from NFL guys that that helped me in my career, but they've been some of the worst sessions I've ever gone to as far as productivity because I can't carry those things over to playing high school football with the kids that I play with or the coaches that I coach with. So, you know, that information is nice. It's, it's knowledge is great to have, but the application of knowledge is the more important quest that we should be on. And how are we going to apply these things to high school kids? You know, how am I going to apply these things in a game that is so much different than the game that we're seeing all the Twitter clips of and all the PDFs of and, you know, all the fantastic drawings of what Saban does and what Brent Venables does. And, you know, those things are beautiful. They're awesome to look at on a phone or on a computer. But if I can't take that and use it with my kids in high school, and I've been a high school coach for 25 years, you know, that information is only good for me. It's only good for talk on on Zoom or, or on YouTube or somewhere else. At some point, you know, a lot of people ask me all the time about, you know, hey, you, you, you know, you call your brand play fast football and you talk about all these things. How do the kids play all that? Well, all the things that I talk about on the whiteboard, I don't carry all those things into a game. I don't, I don't carry all those coverages or all those pressures or all those fronts. You know, if we only carry certain things week in and week out, we only carry things that our kids can do. So, you know, on a whiteboard and for a YouTube video, it's awesome to be able to do different things. And it's awesome to talk about all these different things. Like when we talk about defending a single and we go through five or six different ways that we can defend a single. I think what guys get confused with sometimes is there's been years where I've gone in and we've only played the single receiver one way. Now, just because I'm doing a video on different ways to play the single doesn't mean that I'm playing all those things. Guys will come back and say, well, coach, do your safeties, can your safeties and corners play, you know, sky cloud, hard, hawk, cut, cone, can they do all those things? Well, no, we don't do all those things with our guys. We choose from that menu and we figure out what our kids can do. And then we limit the game plan down to that. You know, if we talk three by one adjustments and, and you know, I, I go through four or five different three by one coverages. We don't carry all five three by ones into the game. We probably only carry two that week or maybe three at the most. You know, one we will carry one that's really good to the trips, one that's really good to the single. And then a third one, if we are just getting torched in the first two, then we'll go to the third one. But we almost never go into a game carrying five or six three by one checks. You know, it's just something that you talk about in clinics. It's something that you talk about on, you know, in Zoom meetings. It's something everybody wants information. Everybody wants to go get, you know, all the the flavor of the week, the hotness, the the, you know, the new stuff that's out there. And in clinic season when you've been out of football for two months and you're just chomping at the bit to get back with your coaches, you know, your, your coaches around the country that you talk to on social media that you know are going to the same clinic. It's great to get in a room with those people, you know, especially after the pandemic. It's great to meet face to face. It's great to go and talk and go to a breakout room and, and have a breakout session. Those things are all beautiful things to do. But at the end of the day, you've got to play high school football. You've got to defend high school offenses. You've got to play with a high school staff and high school players. So what we really need to ask ourselves are all, all those things necessary you know, a lot of times when I go to the clinic, when I go to clinics, it's more for me and my knowledge than it is for maybe my program or my players, because there may only be one thing I bring back from a clinic that I use with my team or with my program, because everything else that I learned was good for me. It was good knowledge to have, but I don't know if I can use it in the setting that I'm in. So I think sometimes you got to be able to look at stuff like that and, and really discern what's best for you. And, and, you know, in a, in a roundabout way, getting back to what we started with, run fits have to be what's best for you and best for your kids. How can you fit gap schemes consistent? How do you play power? How do you play counter? How can you fit them consistently with, you know, consistently with very, with very few changes? If you do change fronts or coverage, does your system stay relatively the same? Are you trying to keep the same theories? Or every time you change fronts or coverages, your fits change so dramatically that it's a brand new deal for the players that are involved. You know, so it, for me, it's finding a way to play more static, simplistic fronts, static, simplistic keys, static, simplistic fits, 
and making the offense beat us at what we're good at, making them find a way to beat us at the things we do well, not letting them beat us because on paper I want to run five different things and they all look good on the chalkboard when we left on Sunday. And then on Friday night we found out that, well, that game plan wasn't very good because we couldn't execute it. Um, you know, so again, right now, in, and this could change in the next couple of weeks, but, you know, right now I think it's odd front. Right now I think it's tight front mostly. You know, right now I think it's still playing three high structures and fitting our runs off of that. Um, you know, right now it's 3-1 light box to two by two, and it's 3-2 box to almost everything else. Um, you know, and then it's building a plan off of the base to say, okay, how are we going to send five? How are we going to send six? How are we going to generate tackles for losses? How are we going to keep the ball inside and front and in front? How are we going to work in pass coverage to play top down and, and make the ball go underneath and, and make them continue to throw it underneath? And then how do we put together a game plan to say when we're going to be aggressive, when we're going to be passive, how long do we want to play base? How good are we at playing base? And then when do we need to pressure? And really as a defense, if you can pressure when you want to pressure, that's when you're, playing good defense when you pressure because you have to or you pressure because you can't stop somebody else you know normally on defense that's when you get into a lot of trouble when you pressure when you want how you want because you play great base defense to me that's how you put a defensive game plan together and that's how you are sound year in year out um and i've been guilty of that in the past i've been guilty of making too many changes going to clinics seeing things that i like watching college film, watching all 22, listening to guys on social media and finding out that, you know, one year we want to be tight. One year we want to be reduction. One year we want to be even. One year we want to play four, two, five. One year we want to play three, three, five. And then what you end up finding out is you lose the carryover from season to season. What did your ninth graders do? What did you do with your JV? I'm a big proponent. Anywhere I go, I try to do the same things on JV that we do on varsity. We just cut the playbook down to 30%, you know, so our JV is going to do the same things our varsity does. We're only going to do about 30% of it. So maybe we only carry one three by one. Maybe we only carry one five man pressure. Maybe we only carry one six man pressure and we play base defense and that's about it. But the JV is going to do the things that the varsity does and they're going to play the things that the varsity does because when those kids come up, I want them to have the potential to learn and roll over in a scheme that is the same. When the JV does things just to do them, or the JV is the scout team for the varsity, so each week, whatever the other offense is running, that's what the JV is going to run in their game on offense because they're the scout team all week. If the JV has a completely separate staff and they go on a completely different field and practice on their own, and you have no idea what the JV is running, I think you're kind of hurting your program. Um, you know, Similar to if you change defenses every year, I think you're hurting your program. Now, if you make a change out of necessity, whether it be personnel, who your opponent is, you know, whatever, whatever the deal, you know, whatever the deal may be, and you make a change, I think obviously change is good. I think innovation is good. But every time you make a change, there's a new learning curve. Coaches are learning it. Players are learning it. It's something new. So the ability to play it consistently and the ability to, you know, have kids understand exactly what you're trying to do. That all kind of changes every time you make changes. So if you can find a way to be consistent, you know, if you're an even team, then maybe stay even and try and find different ways to help your even front. If you're an odd front team, maybe you stay odd and you make some adjustments to your odd package. If you're middle of the field open, maybe you stay middle of the field open and you find some ways to disguise or protect your coverages. If you're Ripley's match, you stay Ripley's match, but you find other ways to protect what you're doing, because at the end of the day, when you do that, I think there's consistency. I think there's carryover. I think your kids get used to doing things a certain way. I think there's carryover in your practices. I think there's carryover in your drills. And then when there's carryover and there's consistency, you can now allow your coaches to be more particular with techniques and fundamentals. If your coaches don't have to coach scheme every week, and they don't have to coach the differences in scheme every week with a new game plan. They can spend more time on block destruction. You can spend more time tackling. You can spend more time, you know, 
how you're going to cover certain beaters in, in half line or full scale or whatever it is, because if there's not a ton of change in the schematics, you should be able to spend more time in other areas. Anytime schematics change, you're always going to have to understand that you're going to have to make adjustments. You're going to have to teach the scheme. And if Monday's install is different or new schemes, then that means Tuesday you're hoping that the kids remember what you just did on Monday. Wednesday you're trying to clean it all up and make sure it's good. Thursday you're trying to give a refresher. And then Friday you're crossing your fingers, hoping that this new scheme or this adjustment works for you and the kids can play it right. So, um, you know, if you can – if you can figure out a way to keep now, I don't want to say that you can play the same scheme every week. Um, I think you can play the same toolbox. I think you can keep things very similar in nature and have some tweaks. You know, maybe you tweak. Um, thank you, CJ. And thank, and I agree with you all 22. Thank you. Um, if, if you can keep things in the same, at least, uh, you know, the same genre, the same toolbox, the same, and then tweak from there. I think you're okay. It's when you jump from, you know, all of a sudden one week, you don't think you can play odd front because a team is 12 personnel double tight. And you try to jump into an even front or something else, or you try to play an extra D lineman or something different. Yes. You can have success doing that. And yes, it's better than maybe going in with a subpar plan that you know, isn't going to work. But again, it's still new scheme. It's new to the kids. It's different. Um, you know, so the more you can stay true to who you are with tweaks and, you know, maybe some movement or a new pressure or a the same pressure, but changing the path, maybe changing who goes first, you know, however you want to do it. I think you got a better point, a better chance if you're doing that because your coaches are comfortable they can coach. Your players are comfortable. They can play. And I think the other thing you got to keep in mind is a lot of high schools have two-way players, right? So if you've got two-way players that you have to count on to play offense and defense, how much can you really carry in a scheme and expect a kid to play it if he's playing both ways? Um, you know, uh, if – thank you, bud. I appreciate it. Um, if If – if you're the, 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 the average high school across the country and, you know, your best wide receiver is also your best corner or safety and you need them on both sides of the ball, well, then on both sides of the ball, it's hard to carry all the things you want to carry. Either he's predominantly one side and he's a stopgap on the other side, or if he's truly a two-way player that you count on to play both ways, you probably need to cut some things out of your scheme and you probably need to cut back on your playbook and your game plan because that kid's never going to get it. You know, he doesn't have enough time. There's not enough time in the week. There's not enough time in a day. And it's not fair to, you know, your your position coaches on that side of the ball to expect that they're going to get all these things done with a kid that they only see half the time. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think if we if we lean back towards simplicity, if we lean back to doing things that are fundamentally sound and we lean back on giving our kids a chance to be repetitive, um, you know, with, you know, our intent is that our kids are going to play very physical, very fast, and we're going to play sound on defense. Well, I think if you scale things back and you become, again, you know, the thing that defensive guys hate is when you use the word static, simplistic. You know, if you become static and simple, most defensive guys think you're going to get ripped. And, you know, I can agree with that to a point, but if you're very good at what you do, you'll still have a good chance to win a lot of football games and if your change-ups are good and your game plan is good, then playing great base defense with kids that are fast and physical that play with great fundamentals with a few change-ups and a few wrinkles that are very easy to practice and, and, and execute, then I think you're always going to have a chance to play you know, great football. And if I've made any mistakes in my career, one of them is always trying to out-coach somebody or always trying to – one up a guy on the other sideline when I'm not playing, he's not playing. It's kids on the field that are playing, you know, and it's always trying to maybe do a little bit too much as a play caller to feel like egotistically we had this big impact on the game as a play caller. When real in reality, our job as a play caller should be making sure our practices are good, making sure our structures are fundamentally sound 
and then calling the things on Friday that put our kids in position to win. If we constantly worry about as a coordinator or a play caller, if we worry about being this superhero on Friday night and, you know, being the last one with the marker and we got to win all these scenarios, we're probably going to put our kids in a bad spot. So um, that's my, uh, that's my deal on run fits right now where I'm at. Um, that's why I like playing tight front stuff. Um, that's why I like keeping run fits as simplistic as possible. That's what I'm going to try and stick to going into our spring ball. Um, again, uh, as clinics come and, and things go from a, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, I'm sure at some point I'm going to make some wrinkles and make some changes, but right now I am dead set on being tight front, being tight front as often as possible, being tight front to three man surfaces and giving my kids a chance to play fast and physical, and that's where we're going to go. So um, let me answer this before we get out of here. We've been on for an hour and six minutes on a Saturday night. I appreciate everything you guys do. How much data from a defense standpoint is this? Uh, the problem, uh, all 22, is not necessarily how much data. It's what data you're looking at. So um, if you're playing a scheme that uh, isn't effective because you're just getting manhandled or your kid's – are inferior every week to the opponent you're playing, that will always be the hardest transition to make because it's very hard to figure out if the scheme is wrong if you don't have a chance physically going in to begin with. Um, so, you know, you're always looking at things like explosives. You're always looking at how many rushing yards you give up. You're always looking at how many passing yards you give up. You know, you're always looking at the personnel coming up from JV or the junior high and things like that. But, um, you know, the, the toughest part to me as a coordinator – is trying to figure out when the scheme is the issue and when it's more how you teach it, who the players are, what the matchup is. Um, that's always going to be the hardest part in our game and probably at any level, I would say, but in, in high school, especially when, when so many games are lopsided going in, you know, it's very hard for you to figure out if a scheme is good. If the other team has six or eight D one guys and you have one kid that's going to play, Division two college football schemes are going to kind of go out the window that night because no matter what scheme you play, you probably are in for a long night. Um, now, I think that's where schemes can help a little bit, because I think if you can pr provide a scheme that your kids can play, that is difficult for the other team to run with the system that they run. I think you can stay in a game a little bit longer. Um, I think you can make your team competitive, but. The problem with high school football, in my opinion, is is in a lot of parts of the country, including Florida, where I am, 70 to 80 percent of the games have probably already been decided when the coin gets flipped. Um, and I know there's probably some people who either don't agree with that or have a problem with it. But, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you could take Georgia's roster and Georgia's coaches and put them in a Vanderbilt uniform and get the same result. It's not the school. It's not the colors. It's the kids playing and the guys that are coaching. Um, you know, and I'm pretty sure, no knock on Vanderbilt, but I'm pretty sure if you took Vanderbilt's coaching staff and they coached Georgia's players, they may not win a national championship, but I'll bet you they win nine or ten games simply because when you get on the field, the kids are going to play, the players are going to play. That's why signing day is such a big deal. That's why recruiting is such a big deal. That's why in the offseason people go crazy about recruiting and signing day and four stars and five stars because everybody understands that if you have better players, you have a better chance to win games, right? And high school, unfortunately, was supposed to be about school zones and where kids live. And a lot of times as a coach, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're playing a hand with cards that you're dealt and you don't have a chance to get dealt new cards. You don't have a chance to trade your cards in. You get five cards and you're forced to play a hand and somebody else has three wild cards in their hand. And you have, you know, five different cards of five different suits that don't connect and you're forced to play a hand with that. You know, how do you, you know, how do you win that scenario? And, and uh, you know, it's changed a little bit in high school. I mean, there's kids going to different places. Now there's kids going to different schools. Um, you know, I'm now um, I'm now at a private school, which is different for me. I've never been in a private school. I've always been a huge advocate um, for private schools and public schools being separate uh, and playing for separate championships. I still believe that to this day, even as a coach now at a private school, I think private schools should play for a different championship than public schools. Um, 
just because, you know, it's different. We don't have, a, you know, we don't have school zones. Now, yes, we have more difficult um, entry procedures. Yes, we have tuition that kids are paying. So, you know, private school guys will make the argument that it's easier to get kids into public schools than it is to private schools. Um, but I'll still make the argument that you don't have a school zone and you're, you're actively going out and trying to attract students. You know, maybe you're not actively trying to attract football players per se, but you're trying to attract students to come to your school that are living in several different neighborhoods from all across the area. That's not the same as a public high school. So, you know, I grew up in New York. I grew up on Long Island, public high school football and private or Catholic high school football is separated. They don't play each other and they don't play for the same titles. So, you know, I agree that maybe you can play during the season uh, because of geography, because of travel. Um, eventually, private schools are going to run out of teams to play, and you don't want to drive three hours. Nobody has the money to do that, and nobody wants to drive three hours to play a football game, you know, during the regular season. Uh, so I do agree with that. But, you know, outside of playing, you know, in a, in a regular season, um, I don't think that – they should play for the same championship. But again, that's just me. That's my opinion. Um, even though I coach at a private school, that's still my opinion on it. And uh, we'll kind of leave it at that because that's a, that's an elephant in the room and it's a topic for a different time. Uh, and could probably do a whole live stream on how high school football's changed and how I think it's ruined the dynamic of high school football and how I think it's ruining the dynamic of college football. So I appreciate all you guys being here on a Saturday night. Appreciate everything you do for Play Fast Football. Appreciate you uh, not only listening to what I have to say about certain topics, but then giving your response on uh, on certain topics. And, and again, I learn something every week that I'm in here. Every time you guys comment, um, whether you're asking me a question or not, it's actually beneficial for me because every time you guys ask a question, I then have to think about how I answer that question. And then when I answer that question, I have to think about, do I like the answer I gave or is that person onto something? Um, you know, so anytime we can do these, it's always great. I'm going to do more and more as the off season uh, rolls around. If you're on Twitter tomorrow night, if you're a Twitter uh, Twitter person tomorrow night, eight o'clock, uh, hashtag FLHS FB chat. Um, and I'll see if I can just go, go ahead and do this. Um, it's eight o'clock Eastern. Uh, hashtag FLHS. FB chat, 8 o'clock Eastern on Sunday nights. Um, I'll get on there from 8 to 9, uh, throw out a couple partners first, and then by 8.15, we'll roll into it. I'll ask five different questions, and you can give your answers to those questions. And um, and all you got to do is put the hashtag, and when you put the hashtag, you can follow the whole conversation, and then everybody can see your responses as long as they have the hashtag. So if you're on Twitter tomorrow night, check us out on hashtag FLHSFBChat. And then also if you're on Twitter – uh, be ready for Super Bowl week, uh, myself and Dome Hats. I think we're going to do a couple, uh, one or two play fast giveaways and then maybe a different Dome Hats giveaway during Super Bowl week. Try and, uh, try and have some fun with Super Bowl week, the last football week of the year until we get back into it in the spring. So going to try and do a couple fun things during the Super Bowl. So appreciate you guys watching. Appreciate everything you guys do for play fast football. Remember, you won't play well until you play fast, and I'll always see you guys next time. Thanks. Be safe.